Welcome. Today is the 7th of June, 2016, and we're joined today by Robertson Jenis, who you might remember from our interview, I think it was interview number 13, on uh, geocentrism and other things. Uh, Robert, thank you for joining us today. Hey, I'm glad to be here, Ryan. So now, um, before we launch into today's topic, um, if again, last time we talked about uh, a little bit about the principle and other issues in geocentrism, and you know, if the listener doesn't know, really know much about this, I mean, you can go to that interview, and I pretty much hammered Robert with every single objection I could find from anyone who took his position seriously. So uh, they answered it fan- you know, fabulously. So if you would uh, go there, I'll link that up at the bottom of the interview. So I just wanted an update. Uh, the principle has been released on DVD. And I was wondering if there's been any follow-up, what other projects you might be working on, and uh, things of that sort. Yes, we uh, have included uh, the four-and-a-half-hour sequel to the principal on the principal website, and that is titled Journey to the Center of the Universe. And that is um, a, a DVD that gets into much more detail and is very comprehensive regarding most of the topics that the principal talked about but didn't have time to go into at any length because it was basically a theatrical release for 90 minutes. And um, that's selling very well, and uh, people are becoming uh, very enthused about the topic, and they're learning a lot. And I'm very happy to, uh, to see all that happen. We are making another DVD uh, called Galileo was wrong, the church was right, which is a historical uh, review of the church's uh, uh, battle with Galileo and all the movements that led up to that and all the movements that came from that uh, in the next 500 years, uh, right up until the 1992 uh, speech by John Paul II to the Pontifical Academy of Science about Galileo. So we cover all that history, and that is a five-hour DVD, but we're also making a shorter version uh, for 90 minutes for those who uh, can't sit there for five hours and watch the whole thing. So uh, that's another technique I'm trying to do uh, to make it more saleable. That is one of the problems with very lengthy things. I know a lot of times some of the best BBC documentaries are probably about six, seven hours long, but they break them up into four-hour and 15-minute sections or something of that sort. So here we basically, the 90 minute is saying the same thing as the five hour uh, DVD, but uh, it's just in more detail. That's all. Well, it sounds interesting. And as you uh, get more updates on that, I'll be happy to share those along. We've sold oh. about uh, close to 8,000 units uh, so far across the world. And that's uh, been since uh, December of uh, last year. So it's only been about six months. So we're doing pretty well. Well, certainly. So now, while you've sort of become the face of geocentrism in many ways, on the other hand, some people who are either you know, new to you or you work also, might not also know that you're a Catholic apologist, you're a biblical scholar, you're fluent in Hebrew and in, and in Greek, classical Greek. So today we're going to talk about the book of the Apocalypse, the last book of the Bible, the most mysterious book of the Bible, which has a number of questions, strange interpretations. It's described as a very confusing book. And there's there are many commentaries and discussions about it. So to start with, is this book, the Apocalypse or Revelation, as it's called in, in many modern Bibles, is it all prophetical and allegorical, or does it also have a literal sense that could be followed through the normal Catholic hermeneutic of exegesis? Well, it's both. Uh, it has some literal sections, but it mostly is prophetic. Uh, anything after chapter three is prophetic. The first three chapters are talking about the historical churches in Asia Minor. The seven churches. So the language is uh, more, much more literal than it is in the remainder of the book. But there are a lot of uh, symbols that are used even in the first three chapters. Basically, John is setting us up for the symbols that he's going to be showing us in the latter part of the book. But um, the book can be confusing if you don't have the key to unlock its secrets. And that's basically the way it was written. It's like Jesus giving parables. And he said, the reason I give parables is because I actually want to hide information from those who are seeking with uh, false motives or with hypocritical motives or whatever, like the Pharisees were, for example. And he says, but to you, I've given the keys to the kingdom of heaven uh, through these parables to know uh, through the teachings that I give you how to interpret them. And Jesus actually did teach them how to interpret these parables. 
and so they can they had the key to unlock the the mystery there. So in one sense, yes, it can be very confusing. In another sense, it's very simple once you have the key. And uh, the way I have simplified it in my book is to show that um, the message is very simple because the message basically is covering uh, the time period from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. And all the details that fit in between those two times uh, yes, they're told in symbolic language, but we have enough information in Scripture to unlock the symbolic language to know what it means. And um, within that first and second coming of Christ, there are uh, seven sections that uh, John has written the Apocalypse. And once you get these seven sections, uh, it becomes quite easy because all seven sections are actually saying the same thing, just in different ways. For example, uh, the first section will be uh, chapters 1 through 3, uh, dealing with the seven churches. The second section is chapters 4 through 6. It begins with the first coming of Christ and ends with the second coming of Christ. If, if you know anything about chapter 6, the, the end there talks about the sun being dark and the stars falling from heaven, blah, blah, blah. So we know that that's talking about the end of the world. Then it picks up again in chapter 7 uh, through 9, and again, we have the same sequence. We have the... Uh, first coming of Christ talked about, and then it ends with the second coming. Then it picks up again with uh, chapter 10 and 11. That's another section. And again, in chapter 11, we have basically an uh, apocalyptic language of the end of the world. Then it picks up again in chapter 12 uh, with the birth of Christ and Mary and the church and all that. And then it ends in chapter 14 with the harvest, which is the end of the world again. So it's the second coming of Christ. And for uh, section 6, it picks up with chapter 15, again with the first coming of Christ, and then ends in chapter 19 with the uh, with uh, the man white riding on the white horse to end the world. So again, we have this apocalyptic language at the end of that section. Then it picks up again at the beginning uh, with the first coming of Christ in chapter 20, and it ends in chapter 22 with the uh, the heavenly state. So again, you know, we have the first and second coming of Christ in each of these sections of the Apocalypse. So once you break it up that way, it becomes relatively easy. Now, the work uh, passed down to us in Greek, was it originally written in Greek, or does it have the sense that it had a Hebrew or Aramaic original? No, uh, the Apocalypse was originally written by, in Greek by John uh, on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, usually we assign the uh, date of 95 AD to that. Where John basically was an old man, and he was receiving visions uh, on this island and writing them in Greek, because that was his language. Well, actually, there's only one book in the New Testament that might have had a, a, a uh, second uh, authorship in Hebrew, and that's the book of Matthew. Uh, we're not even sure of that, however. Uh, we do know that the inspired version was written in Greek. So there really is no question about the apocalypse, uh, especially being of such late origin first century. What's the overall point of the book taken as a whole? The overall point of the book is very simple. It's just like the Gospels. It's just like the Epistles. And that is, uh, one thing that it stresses is that the devil is real, he exists, and he has demons, and they are uh, the powers of the air that come after the church to try to destroy it. And uh, God is above all this. He's watching it all take place. And he is pulling the strings, uh, as it were, to uh, to uh, deal with the devil. And a lot of it is dependent on the church's uh, obedience, whether the church is going to be faithful or not. And this is why John begins the book with the seven churches in Asia Minor. Five of those churches are falling into uh, faithlessness, apostasy, uh, whatever. Two of them are remaining faithful. So we can see right from the get-go that uh, the picture is uh, sort of, uh, uh, well, kind of dim for the church, because uh, the, the, the five out of seven churches that are falling due to these attacks of the devil uh, does not uh, bode well for uh, you know the future of the church, so to speak, and this goes along with a lot of Catholic prophecies that, you know, we the apostasy will come. Uh, but these are churches in the first century, and if they're having a hard time, we can imagine what's going to happen later. 
when, uh, as Jesus said, the, the wood is uh, it's not green, it's, it's old. So uh, that's the forecast. The idea here is that, and this is the, this uh, idea that the devil is the prominent figure in the apocalypse, and he actually comes to attack the church, is uh, opposed to a lot of um, liberal teaching we have today uh, that started around the, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, that the devil isn't real. You know, the devil's just a figment of our imagination. Uh, you know, all these kinds of things that the liberal Catholics are teaching today. Well, John's message is exactly the opposite. The devil is real, and he's so real that John has to graphically describe his exploits against the church so that we get a clear picture of what is happening in this world. So does it only deal with these particular ideas, the devil assaulting the church, the end of the world, or does it also have some events that were contemporary to John? Well, uh, the, the, the events that were contemporary to John were dealt with in the first three chapters when he, when he deals with the seven churches in Asia Minor. After that, everything is symbolic in the, in the apocalypse. Really no contemporary event that John pinpoints either in his time or that he predicts in our time. So all this hullabaloo that you hear from these uh, uh, different commentaries, well, this this section of the Apocalypse refers to the Protestant Reformation, or this section refers to the Muslims, or this section, that's all guesswork, and it doesn't apply. So or to Nero, no, for me. Because a lot of times I hear, again? well, a lot of times we'll hear that uh, it goes, oh, this is referring to Nero. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nero is given the number 666, and, and the only way they can do that is by putting an end on the, on the his first name. It has to be Neron Caesar in order to do that. So, uh, you know, th there might be allusions to this, and, and as a matter of fact, John makes a lot of allusions to the Old Testament without ever quoting one verse from the Old Testament. So there might be allusions to, to certain things that have happened, but John is just not specifying anything, and, and for good reason, because he doesn't want us to get caught up into saying, well, this, this represents this person in history, and that represents that person in history, because if we do that, we're going to get really confused, believe me. Uh, he's just giving us a general outlay of how the gospel comes to us and what happens to the churches afterwards once they receive the gospel. And basically, um, Apocalypse 6 gives us a clear outline of basically how to understand the rest of the apocalypse. Because you have these four horsemen, the white horse, the black horse, the gray horse, and, uh, sorry, the, the, the white horse, the, uh, the red horse, uh, the gray horse, and then the black horse. Uh, and basically all that is telling us is the white horse is the gospel that comes to the church, and that you know, happened at Pentecost. The red horse is Satan who attacks the church, and we read that in the book of Acts and through uh, Paul's epistles, that Satan is always attacking the church. The gray horse is the uh, judgment that God is going to give to the church, uh, or against the church, when it disobeys. And then the black horse is if you don't obey these punishments that God gives you, then he comes with a black horse, which is death. And then the remaining part of, of Apocalypse 6 is the end of the world. Uh, because if, if at the end you don't obey and he has to punish you totally, then that's the end. The church no longer uh, will be here. So that's a, just a basic outline of the whole of the Apocalypse just in one chapter. And it's, uh, it's very enlightening when you look at it that way. And then you have uh, right before uh, Apocalypse 6, you have Apocalypse 4 and 5, where John sees this vision in heaven of the uh, 24 elders surrounding the throne, and, and he, and he had, sees the, the, the living beings, the four living beings, and they have eyes all over them. Well, these eyes represent the fact that God is looking at every single detail in this world as it exists today and controlling every single thing that goes on. Nothing happens, as Jesus said. You know, God watches the sparrow that falls from the sky, and he doesn't fall unless he has God's consent. Well, the same thing's true with the apocalypse and the whole time between the first and second coming of Christ. Nothing happens unless God permits it to happen, which means that God is in control of everything. And that's what uh, Apocalypse 4 and 5 are telling us. And then he says, once once you know that, well, then you you have everything you need to obey me, to be faithful to me, because you know I am true. You know that I see everything. You know that I'm in control of everything, and therefore you have no excuse. And so that's why he comes up with Apocalypse 6 and gives us this uh, scenario between the first and second coming of Christ. 
fascinating. Right there, I think, is better than any sermon I've ever heard on the topic. So the next question, then, is the, the most prominent individual we see in the, uh, in the book, or at least has the most people are looking for the most and trying to pay as much attention to, is the Antichrist. You know, so what's the provenance of this term? In the Greek, and you know, where else do we? See, what else does the Bible tell us about Antichrist? Well, you know, it's funny because the Apocalypse doesn't actually mention the word Antichrist. Okay, so this this uh, word comes from uh, John's epistles. He mentions the Antichrist four times, uh, but you would have to say that the Antichrist is alluded to in the Apocalypse, although it's it's mentioned in detail in his epistles. Um, and the prominent passage uh, outside of the Apocalypse that talks about this individual is Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. And there he is called the man of sin, or the man of iniquity. Uh, and uh, we have traditionally understood this as referring to one man. Uh, you know, that's probably true. Um, but the... the um, the salient feature of this Antichrist, when he comes, will be as Second uh, Thessalonians 2, verses um, uh, 9 and 10 say, and that is he will be a miracle worker. This guy will bring down, well, well actually will call upon all the preternatural forces that he has, and he will perform miracles, just like, for example, the... Um, uh, Let's say the uh, the Egyptian uh, uh, sorcerers perform miracles right alongside of Moses when Moses was doing his miracles to try to convince Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. Uh, they were performing miracles, and now they're limited in what they can do because they can only use preternatural forces, not supernatural forces. Supernatural forces are forces that can actually create something out of thin air. Well, actually, or we should say, out of, out of nothing, ex nihilo. That's that's something reserved only to God. But the devils and the demons have the preternatural power, which is to take created things and distort them or use them uh, to deceive in, in certain ways by rearranging them or 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 uh, shining a light here on this part of it where they don't shine it over here, and making you look at something and be deceived by that. Well, this guy who comes, this Antichrist, is going to have par excellence power in doing so. And that's what it says, and uh, that's what Paul warns us about. So that's going to be his main identity. This is not going to be some just political leader, somebody with a lot of money, somebody with, uh, you know, influence socially or culturally. This is going to be somebody who grabs the attention of the whole world because he's the only one who has this power to work these pseudo-miracles to convince everybody that, yes, he is God, you see, because he can do these very things that God did. And uh, that's why uh, Paul says in verse 3 there that he's going to take a seat in the temple and declare himself God. Well, you can only do that if you can back it up, and he's going to be able to back it up by these miracles. And as a matter of fact, the Apocalypse talks about these very same miracles, so... Uh, in the, for example, Apocalypse 16 talks about the miracles that the, this this uh, pseudo god is going to have to be able to deceive people. Saint Robert Bellarmine, as a doctor of the Church, wrote a, a whole book on Antichrist, which makes up part of his treatise on the Roman Pontiff, which was meant to refute what was at that time in the early 16th century the universal Protestant doctrine that the Pope was the Antichrist. So he went to set out various things about the Antichrist to show very clearly that none of this agrees, none of this fits the Pope, and the Pope therefore cannot be the man of sin talked about in Scripture. And one of the things he does is he says that you know, Antichrist is going to be a specific man, and he takes the universal testimony of the Fathers on who he is going to be. So what does Catholic tradition tell us about who Antichrist is going to be? Where is he going to come from? Well, there's been all kinds of... Uh speculation on that, but uh, the scripture doesn't tell us, okay, so we can't we can't point to that. We can only speculate on who it might be, but uh, I personally just don't like to get into that kind of speculation because I've seen all the speculation that's been done before. Uh, everybody from the first centuries like uh, Nero, Caesar, 
Caligula to Richard Nixon or uh, Henry Kissinger in the 20th century, you know, Hitler, Mussolini, uh, you know, and all, everybody has been, has been put into this slot of being the so-called Antichrist, and of course they've all been wrong. So uh, that's why I refrain from speculating on it. And um, so I can only give you the general picture. Uh, that's 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 what a biblical <laughs> right. Well, actually, that's what I was looking for. I think I misspoke. Well, when I said who, I didn't mean like you know who he is. Like is it is it George W. Bush? I didn't oh, okay. I didn't mean okay. that. I didn't mean that. I mean what signs will there be that you know that they'd say in the tradition that we're going to know like he's going to come from this source. He's going to be from this type of place. He's going to come from this type of people, etc. Yeah, we don't know that specifically. There's just not enough information in Scripture to make that kind of designation. All I can tell you for sure is that whoever he is, we will know who he is because he will have these powers that no one else in history has had. And that's the telltale sign. Many people talk about the number 666, right? Apart from the question of the Antichrist and the end of the world, it's probably one of the also the most talked about things in the book of the Apocalypse that people would know and recognize. Everyone knows 666, what do you mean? It means something evil and something bad. People, you know, avoid pricing things at $6.66 because people won't buy it, you know, so you have things of this sort. <laughs> and historically, Various people attempted to show what the number means, even all the way back to St. Irenaeus. Uh, the early Protestants all tried to show that it means Latinos, that it would be Latin, although it's actually misspelled a bit as uh, Bellarmine showed, but you know, thus it would mean the Pope. So how are Greek numbers formed in such a way that through this gematria you can also produce letters and therefore names and other things? And then wh what does 666 mean in the tradition? Well, first of all, the Bible does not teach gematria, and gematria can be rather confusing. Uh, this is a, a technique that was uh, developed in the early part of the church, uh, where they assigned certain um, letters to numbers and vice versa. And uh, I've been through it all, believe me. I, I've studied it. I can just tell you it's not a place you want to go. Uh, what 666 really means is, as the Bible, especially the Apocalypse, focuses on the number seven. The number seven, I think, is mentioned 49 times in the Apocalypse, if I remember, more than any other number. And, the, and so seven becomes a symbolic number. This, it hits us right when we open up the, the first chapter, it talks about the seven spirits of God. So right away, well, you know God doesn't have seven spirits, right? There's only one spirit. So why does John use the word seven? Well, because it's a symbolic number. He's setting you up for the rest of the apocalypse to show you how symbolic these numbers are going to be. You see. So God has basically the number seven as his number. And so the devil, and we see this throughout the apocalypse, the devil mimics what God does. And that's how he tries to deceive everyone. And another way he does that is by mimicking the fact that God chose a number for himself. So he's going to choose a number for himself. As a matter of fact, where you find this number 666 in the Apocalypse is, is Apocalypse 13, verse 18. But there it says, it's the number of the beast. Okay? It doesn't say it's the number of a man. It says the number of the beast. The beast is a... is the, It's the beast that comes from uh, Apocalypse 13 at the beginning... The beast basically takes over from the dragon, because the dragon was defeated by Michael in uh, Apocalypse 12, and so the beast now does the bidding of the dragon, and then he incorporates another beast called the second beast in the remaining chapter of Rev uh, Apocalypse 13, and, but he's the beast. And then it says uh, in verse 18, he's the number of mankind. That's the way the Greek reads. It's the Greek word anthropos without the article. Uh, so it's not the man, it's mankind. This is the number of mankind, 666. And so it's just a symbolic treat, treatment of, of who man is that is opposed to God that's in contention with the 777 of God himself, you see. So it's very simple. It doesn't apply to any particular person or the Antichrist, or, or anything of that sort. It's just giving us the uh, symbolic number of the devil as opposed to the symbolic number of God. Fascinating. So 
in the line of a few things you've mentioned, is it possible for the Pope to be the Antichrist? <laughs> I know right now with Francis, a lot of conservative Catholics are scratching their head. Well, maybe. <laughs> As I mentioned, Bellarmine wrote 30,000 words to show how that couldn't be the case. Yeah, so just... I would say from everything I read in Scripture that, no, that is not possible for the Pope to be the Antichrist. He, it, it is possible for, for the Pope to fall and be faithless and do things wrong uh, because there's no guarantee that uh, he will be impeccable. Uh, there's, the only guarantee we have for the Pope is that he will be infallible when he's proclaiming uh, in, in, in ex cathedra forum doctrines for the Catholic Church. But mo most of those have already been done. I, don't, I can't see any more doctrines coming down the pike, so I don't think the Pope's going to be posed with that problem. Uh, but he can he can fall, he can sin, and he, he can end up in hell. That's, that's very true. But... Uh, being the Antichrist, I have, I see, I have to be honest with you, I see no indication in Scripture that the, he will come from the Church itself. So where will Antichrist reign, and what will he do, and what uh, what area of the world will he reign in? Because this is one where a lot of fundamentalists will pick up their Bibles, oh, and this says seven hills and everything, that's Rome, Rome's the whore of Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon. Yeah, well, see, here's another indication where, you know, seven, if the seven hills are not in, in the Apocalypse, but uh, you know, that could be very symbolic, too. Yeah, but see, this is where people go off the track when they start uh, trying to uh, give contemporary uh, events or people to the prophecies in the apocalypse. The apocalypse was not meant for that. I mean, I was just watching Alex Jones this morning, and he was talking about the 666 number and how we're all going to be chipped and all this stuff. And he says, and, they, and the day they chose to come out with this was, June, which is the sixth month, on the sixth day, and uh, in 2016. So there's your third six, you know. I mean, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just laughing at, you know, and, and, and uh, you, you can expect this kind of thing to happen because these numbers to, to people who aren't educated and aren't aware of how, why and how John wrote the Apocalypse, they grab, they latch onto these figures and these symbolic numbers like nobody's business. And you, you can make them into anything you want, you see. And who's going to disagree with you? How are they going to say that? They don't. So, because they have no uh, understanding of the apocalypse themselves in order to critique it. So, uh, you know, that, that's the problem. So, with regard to the Antichrist, where he's coming, I don't know. I have no idea where he's going to come from. Uh, all I know is that the Bible says he's going to come, and, and Paul makes that crystal clear to us in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, do not be deceived. The world will not end unless this guy comes, and the apostasy comes along with him. Okay? So this helps us to understand the, uh, uh, the eschatological uh, issues that are, are, we are confronted with, because you know, you have a lot of people, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, saying, you know, don't be deceived. Somebody's going to say, here, here, here is Christ. There is Christ. Look over here. There he is. And all this stuff. He says, do not pay attention to them. He says, I will not come unless you see me as lightning shining from east to west. And I will bring, I will come with the trumpet sound and the angels will be there. You will see them. And that that's the only way. I will come and say, you will not be deceived. You will know when I am here, you see. And John, or um, Paul says the same thing about the Antichrist. Uh, when he comes, you will know it, because here are the signs you need to look for. And he must come, otherwise the end cannot come. So uh, he's pretty clear about that, but as to where he's going to come from, he doesn't say. Right. And it really doesn't oh, make sorry. a difference, does it? I mean, if he came yeah. from Russia or if he came from China or Israel or South America, it really doesn't make a difference because he's going to do what he is designated to do as the Antichrist, and that is to deceive the whole world by right. his signs and wonders. 
And so it really does, when he comes, whatever country he comes from, we're going to know it. I only ask the question just because, it, again, with the preface that, you know, the Protestants say, oh, it's going to be in Rome, the Antichrist is going to rule from Rome, therefore it's the Pope, and the Pope's the Antichrist, blah, blah, blah. And the, uh, whereas in the tradition, the fathers say, actually, that it's going to be, that he, he's going to reign from Jerusalem, that at first he's going to use the Jewish religion as a proxy to deceive the Jews, and then through that deceive the world. And that, that was the other, I was just curious on that particular point, because that's something the Church Fathers seem to teach pretty universally. Well, uh, yeah, that, that is certainly a possibility. Now, I have to say that they don't have much to go on in Scriptures to, to pinpoint that kind of specific prophecy, although they do have some indications that allude to that possibility. For example, in Second Thessalonians 2, uh, Paul says that the uh, man of sin will take a seat in the temple. Okay, He doesn't say church. He says temple. Well, that's pretty significant. You know, that may lend itself to saying that we have a Jewish temple here talked about instead of the Catholic Church in Rome, so to speak. But we can't be sure about that because sometimes St. Paul uses the word temple to refer to the church. Okay? Unless he intended a double entendre there, where temple could be used for both the church and the actual temple. And, and it is a fact that they either want to rebuild the third temple in Jerusalem, or they uh, have, have uh, already started it, according to some reports I've heard. So, yeah, there is that possibility. We can't discount what, what the tradition has said, uh, at least with some uh, exegetes in the Catholic tradition, but we can't be sure about that. Now, speaking of uh, you know the church fathers and uh, the exegesis, they also teach that one of the signs that's supposed to happen prior to Antichrist is the return of Enoch and Elijah to the earth to preach. That being because uh, they're both recorded in the Old Testament to have been assumed into heaven of sorts, uh, Enoch and then Elijah both Elijah on the fiery chariot, as we see in Third Kings or First uh, uh, Kings in the modern numbering. So, you know, what do you make of this, that Enoch and Elijah are supposed to come back to preach to, to recover those who have been deceived by Antichrist? Well, I, I think this is where uh, some of the Catholic exegetes went off the rails, to be very honest with you. Uh, Jerome, especially. Um, Jerome, at this point, uh, took Malachi 4 5, which talks about the return of Elijah, from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew. And the Septuagint says, Elijah the Tishbite. And that, to Jerome, uh, meant that, well, if it mentions Tishbite, that means it's specific to Elijah, the Old Testament personage, and not a figure. But the Hebrew says, Elijah will come back, not Elijah the Tishbite. Okay, so you have a big difference there. And unfortunately, Jerome went with the, with the Septuagint instead of the Hebrew, and I don't know why he did that. Uh, but uh, it, his, I think his interpretation is askew, and I think I can back that up by the fact that if, when Jesus is talking to the apostles in the Gospels, he says, if you can accept this, Elijah has already come. And, and then the commentary a few verses later says, and he was referring to John the Baptist, you see. So all indications show us that Malachi 4, 5 was using the figure of Elijah as a as a prediction for the coming of John the Baptist, who was in, uh, Elijah in figure, because he was similar to Elijah in what he did. So that's where I rest my case there. But there's a little bigger story behind this that, that I think people should know. Um, uh, this whole idea of Elijah and Enoch coming back um, was part of the original eschatological schema uh, created by five of the early fathers. And when I say early, I mean early. This was uh, Papias, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, uh, Lactantius, Tertullian, and Polycarp. Uh, they all believed not what we believe today in the Catholic Church about the millennium, and that's the thousand years spoken of in Apocalypse 20. Which we're getting to. That, what's that? That's next on the list of questions. Oh, okay. All right. So I won't say too much about that right now, but and I'll wait for the next question. But uh, at any rate, these these six um, 
early fathers believed in what we understand today as uh, premillennialism, and that is the idea that this world will go on, Christ will come back, and then he will set up a millennial kingdom, uh, millennial being a thousand-year kingdom. And then uh, he will reign from Jerusalem in that thousand-year kingdom, and then the end will come, and then we will all go to heaven or hell, wherever we're, we're designated to go. So they believe that. Okay, now that is diametrically opposed to the amillennial view that the Church believes today, and that was propounded uh, basically by Ambrose and Augustine and a few other fathers, that the millennium is occurring right now. And the millennium is the period of time between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And the Church is reigning now for a thousand years, so to speak. So, so again, we have a symbolic number here. Um, and then uh, the reason that the fathers, these early fathers, believed Enoch and Elijah were going to come back was, uh, first of all, they made the same mistake in reading Malachi 4.5, but uh, more than that, they believed that this thousand-year period was going to be basically a Jewish period, where the Jews were going to be reigning with Christ, and in order to bring the Jews... Uh, uh, or, or in order to uh, help the Jews, I should say, to evangelize the world, the rest of the world, during this future 1,000-year period, well, Enoch and Elijah were going to come back, and these were two Jews par excellence who were going to help in that uh, evangelism of the rest of the world, okay? So, uh, so you see the problem. So the, the <laughs> Well, it's also not the only problem because um, Augustine, Ambrose, Jerome, uh, Bede, uh, the Abbot Rupert, uh, m many of those uh, you know fathers in the fourth and seventh century, they all rejected the thousand year reign, the, the Achilleism. They they all completely rejected that in a common right. consensus opposed to this earlier opinion of Papias and Irenaeus. But yet they still believed in Enoch and Elijah coming back at the end of time. Yeah. Well, see, that's what I think happened is. Uh, as they rejected the, the the future millennium of the early fathers, but they they held on to some of the baggage that these early fathers had and really didn't know what to do with it. And as a matter of fact, if you believe that if if as we believe the millennium is occurring now between the first and second coming of Christ, then there is no reason for Elijah and Enoch to come back because there is no future millennium in order for them to evangelize. So you you sort of get stuck once you once you have undone the whole eschatological framework of the early fathers, then you get stuck with some of this baggage. You don't know where to put it, and that's why we have various interpretations. Some of these fathers believe, well, Enoch's going to come back, and then some said, well, Enoch and Jeremiah are going to come back, and some said Enoch and Elijah are going to come back, and so you have this variation between these fathers, even in the later stages of the patristic era. Uh, because no one really knows for sure how they're going to fit all this extra stuff into their, their new amillennial schema. Hmm. Fascinating. Although, Bellarmine says on that, his comments here, and I think um, Lapide as well, unless I'm mistaken, that, uh, that when Enoch and Elijah you know, come, their purpose will be to convert all the Jews who are deceived by Antichrist. Yeah, I mean... See, you, you still have the baggage. You still have the concentration be, is on the Jews, okay? So what about the rest of the world? The reason the concentration is on the Jews is because the early fathers had set that up, because the whole millennium, the whole 1,000 years was supposed to be for the Jews. Uh, so again, you see, you get that conflation of ideas there between these two different eschatological schemes, and uh, that's what I'm proposing as, as the reason for it. Interesting. So then as we move into the course now, with the, uh, what I'll do is I'll combine this with the, the one of the other questions I had on the rapture. So, so we have this early eschatological view in some of the church fathers, which really seems more of an opinion. Justin Martyr says that, you know, in uh, I think it's in the dialogue with Trifo, that there's some Christians that don't know this, although this is not necessary for faith, he says. And uh, in other places, too, it seems it's clearly an opinion. It does, it's not held by all the fathers, either. In the pre-Nicene period, Cyprian doesn't even find any traces of it, nor in Clement of Alexandria, that I, as far as I know. And so you have, um, 
the leader fathers all come and they condemn this interpretation of the thousand years that this is going to be. So in the, the textbooks in Latin, it's called Chileism. I'm not exactly sure why. And then otherwise, it's called, the St. Augustine calls it millenarianism or thousand yearism. Millennialism is a term used. That's probably the right translation. So how does this get, you know, you have a clear consensus from the fourth century onward, absolutely opposed to this. Jerome goes so far as to call it a Jewish heresy. And then how is it then that, that we see today that the same thousand year millennial reign is now reinvented amongst Protestants as the rapture? And is there a real basis in the book of the apocalypse for holding this view? Yeah, let me just back up a minute uh, and explain why there was a shift uh, among the later fathers away from this premillennial idea. Uh, because Augustine came along and, uh, and he was backed by the Council of Ephesus, which is very important. And the major question that they were trying to settle was, when was the devil bound? Because Apocalypse 20 opens up its chapter by saying, the angel came down from heaven and bound the devil in the bottomless pit, where he could not deceive the nations anymore. And then he shall be loose for a little season. So the question was, and, and this goes back to how you understand the apocalypse, and you can't understand the apocalypse and the time frame it's giving us unless you first understand chapter 20. It's like reading the back of a novel and finding out that the butler did it, and then going back and reading the rest of the novel and go, oh, now I understand why she said that, or he said that, or he did this, because you know the end of the story. And unfortunately, the end of the story for the apocalypse is in chapter 20, because you have to know when the thousand years is taking place in order to understand the rest of the apocalypse. Okay? So the, the big question was, if the, if the thousand years starts with the binding of Satan in this bottomless pit, when did that occur? Did it occur in the Old Testament? Some believe it does. That it occurred with David when he began his reign. Did it occur at the cross when Christ came? Or is it going to occur sometime in the future? When, uh, like the uh, many evangelicals today believe that, that Satan's going to be bound in the future, and, and it's going to be hunky-dory once he's bound. Or is it much more subtle than that? And, and that's what the church finally figured out. It is very subtle, and it happened at the cross when Jesus came. And that's why we have all these references in the gospel to Jesus saying in Luke uh, 10, 18, I saw Satan as lightning falling from heaven, and he's just about to go to the cross. Or Hebrews 2, 14 says uh, that Christ destroyed the power of the devil. Uh, or uh, uh, in Matthew 12, Jesus says, in order to uh, plunder the, the strong man's house, you have to bind the strong man. And, he's, and again, he's just about to go to the cross. And John 12, 31 says, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And Jesus, of course, is just about to go to the cross. And John 16, 11 says the same thing. So what the church figured out was, yes, Satan was bound at the cross, and thus that's where the thousand years must start from in Apocalypse 20. And so then it's just a matter of applying the rest of the figurative language in Apocalypse 20 to various aspects of our Christian life. For example, when it says, when it talks about the first resurrection in verse 6, it says, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Well, Augustine said, obviously then, that has to point to the fact that we have been baptized into Christ and we have been raised from the dead in our souls. Our souls take on a whole new quality now. We, we are, we are, they are not a dead soul anymore, they are a live soul. And uh, and there's many allusions to that in the New Testament, where you know uh, Paul says, "You have been raised with Christ," in Ephesians two six, or Colossians two twelve. You have been raised from the dead in Christ. All that kind of stuff. It's all over the New Testament. So this made sense to Augustine and the Church, and they said, "Okay, this is where we're going to put our anchor. This is where we start the millennium, and everything else after that we can interpret in line with the rest of the New Testament." Now, your, your next question was about... Uh, 
the rapture. Right. So we got the yeah. thousand years down. What does the thousand years mean? And then, you know, so where do uh, Protestants get the rapture? Especially given that, you know, the whole kind of, oh, well, people will be left behind. But you go into Matthew's gospel, Jesus says it'll be like the days of Noah, where one is taken and one is left. And they go, see, see the rapture. But you say, no, 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 look at that again. Who In Noah's flood, who was taken and who was left? The one left behind was Noah and his family on the ark who were saved. And those who were yeah, taken were yeah. damned. Yeah, it, it's rather simple you know, to figure all that out, and I don't know why they get so confused about this. And it has a lot to do with the fact that they have to fit in so many things to this very um, convoluted eschatological schema that they had. I mean, once you once you say that the millennium is in the future, the thousand years, you every every single interpretation you have of every eschatological verse in the New Testament is going to be askew because of that. You see. So you have to have the right foundation in order to build a proper interpretation. And that's why they go off the track. But what, where they're getting this rapture from is 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, where the, it does talk about a rapture there. I mean, if we, we can use that term as Catholics. We could say, yes, these believers that are living on earth when Christ comes for the second coming, what's going to happen to them? Well, according to this passage, it says uh, the dead will be raised first who are already in the grave, and then we who remain alive, that is, we're not dead, uh, will be called up in the air with him, with his angels. Okay, So that is a rapture, but when does it occur? Well, it occurs at the end of time, when, when, God, when Jesus is going to destroy this world, and he's going to create a new heaven, a new earth. And that's where we will go after we're raptured into this new heaven and new earth. We will not stay here for seven more years and watch the world go kaput and bombs start flying like the evangelicals believe. Of course, some of them believe in a you know, pre-trib, a mid-trib, and a post-trib rapture, but it still it doesn't make any difference. It's still a rapture that's put on the wrong side of the fence, so to speak. Hmm. Now, that is really interesting. So lastly, um <coughs> There's a reference to Gog and Magog. And how did they come into the narrative about the end times? Well, Gog and Magog uh, are mentioned in Apocalypse 20, verse 8. And uh, it says that uh, when Satan is loosed from his bottomless pit for his little season, uh, he will go out to uh, the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. And so what we know from this is that. Gog and Magog are representing all of the earth. In other words, Satan, when he is loosed, the, we talk about the Antichrist and all that, he will have influence over the whole world. There will be no escape. There, there's not going to be an island you can go to and say, oh, here's where we can escape You know, the influence of Satan. No, he will have control over the whole world as allowed by God, and this is represented by Gog and Magog because they were used in the Table of Nations uh, in Genesis 10 and 11 as representing all of the nations, Gog and Magog. So it's an appropriate term. As a matter of fact, that's when the Tower of Babel was uh, erected uh, at that point in time, and God scattered the nations. The nations wanted to basically control everything by having this tower and, and solidifying their influence by keeping everybody around this tower and that God confused the languages, and they had to disperse. But at this point, this Gog and Magog is basically creating another Tower of Babel, and which he's going to force all of the people to, to worship, basically. And he's going to do it through these miracles that I talked about before. But that's basically what it is. Gog and Magog represents the whole world. And then lastly, how does the, I guess, how does the book end? You sort of prefaced this in the beginning, but how does the book end? And what does the church wish us to profit by this book? Okay. Well, the the book ends by giving us a a, a sort of a, uh, a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. And in my book, um, I take it a, a, a much further, and I, and I show what the church has said about what heaven is going to be like. Uh, and you have two very opposing views in the tradition uh, in this regard. One is the Augustinian view, which is we're going to be basically uh, completely mobile. 
and we're, we can basically do all that we can possibly do under the powers that God gives us, and we can be here one day and there the next, and, and enjoying the whole creation, basically, uh, through our senses, and whatever, however we have those senses with our new bodies. And, um, you know, so we, we are very free, and it's like flying here and there and everywhere, according to the way Augustine sees things. But Aquinas came along in, in the more contemplative mode of understanding um, Christian theology and God himself, and his view was that we're just going to be staring at God all day, you know, <laughs> basically. And that's, you know, the beatific vision has uh, developed from that. And uh, we, we need no more, according to Aquinas. We're, we're not going to be mobile, so to speak. We're just going to be uh, motionless and of course, he got that understanding from Aristotle that the, the prime position or the prime state of being is motionlessness. Uh, so, you know, it, it went hand in hand with this idea that we're just standing in one place looking at the beatific vision. So you have two contrasting views there between these two great fathers of the Church. Uh, but basically, the, the message of the Apocalypse is very simple. And that's why it starts out in chapters 1 to 3 with warning the churches to remain faithful. That's the big message. Because we we really don't understand how powerful Satan is, because he's invisible. And we can't see where he moves and how he influences people and what he does, except, you know, on the surface we can get certain things. You know, you watch Hillary Clinton for a while, and you can pretty, get a pretty good idea. Okay. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, we uh, need to have a firm grasp in our conscience of who this guy is, the devil. Because you think he's bad now? Well, you wait till he's loosed from his bottomless pit and he comes in the Antichrist and he has the whole world in his grip by the miracles he can do. You better be prepared for that, you see. So uh, that's the, basically the message there. And the other message underlying that is all of this is in control of God. Nothing escapes his, his purview. He will allow Satan to attack if you do not want to remain faithful to God. God is behind it. He says, okay, devil, you have your bidding now. Go after so-and-so or go after the church here or do whatever you want uh, because I'm allowing it to take place. So uh, God is in complete control, but he uses the devil to do his work for those of us that don't remain faithful. Hmm. If I can add one more thing, um, it wasn't on the list I gave you, but it says in Apocalypse 12, the very first verse, it's in Yemanium Aparitum Kelo, Murias, Nicte Sole, etc. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. So now, a lot of people take this to be a, like a scriptural proof text of the Assumption. Well, it seems to me a bit weak on details for that. And even in the Novus Ordo, uh, the 1970 Missal after Vatican II, they have this in the reading for the Feast of the Assumption as the second reading, as if to try to at least apply it to that. So is this a, a valid text to look to for proof of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin? I would say it's not proof, but it's certainly an allusion to the assumption, because Mary does not have that place in heaven with the stars around her, the moon under her feet, unless, of course, she's assumed into heaven to, to uh, get in that position. So in that sense, there's an allusion to it. Uh, but even more importantly, uh, the, when, when people start talking about the assumption uh, as applied to Apocalypse 12, then they get a little confused as to the timing of this passage. The timing of this passage is very clear in verse 6, which says, She produced the man-child and who was to rule all, all nations with the rod of iron. That's Christ coming as the, the baby in Bethlehem. And so that's the timing of this whole passage here. And then there's the uh, battle between Michael and the devil in uh, verses 7 and onward, and Michael wins. And it says, now it's come salvation to the whole world. Well, when did that occur? That occurred when Christ died on the cross, you see. And that's why Jesus said to the apostles, I saw Satan as lightning falling from heaven in Luke ten eighteen. So this whole uh, issue here is about the cross that Christ went to. When Christ ascends, and it says there that he ascends back up into heaven in verse 6, then the devil, uh, in the form of the dragon, comes after the church. And that's why the church goes into the wilderness for this 1260-day period, 
And by the way, that 1260-day period represents the time from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. We see this all throughout the uh, Apocalypse, especially in the in Apocalypse 11, 12, and 13. It's either 42 months, time times, and half the time, or the 1260 days. So, uh, again, the reason I mention all that is because I don't want people to get confused that if we apply the assumption to that figure of Mary in the first verses, that we should not think that that the rest of Apocalypse 12 refers to some time in the future uh, as opposed to the present. Excellent. Now that was that was very very fascinating, and I found it uh, really interesting all the the details to those particular issues you brought. Especially the issue of the six 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 was an interesting one, that because I've usually taken it as well. It means a number, it means someone, but we we're, you can guess all you want. We're never going to figure it out. But the way you explain it actually is much more plausible to me, even though it's yeah. not what you commonly hear. So and we're going to hear more of it. Believe me, I'm sure we will. So uh, <laughs> where can where can people go for more of your work? And I'll, I'll link it up. Okay, uh, I wrote a 650-page commentary on the Apocalypse called The Apocalypse of St. John. Uh, and uh, this was volume two of our Catholic Apologetic Study Bible series. Uh, and you can get that from our website, uh, or you can write to me personally. And uh, it's, I don't know which it is. it's published by Queenship Publishing back in uh, 2006 or something. And uh, so you can get it from there also. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's available all over. Okay. And we also have a an abridged edition, uh, Apocalypse of Saint John, not an abridged edition, which is I think about uh, 150 pages, where I just take the salient points of the uh, big book and, and make it easier reading for people. Okay, I'll find those and I'll link them up so people can get uh, quicker access to them. Robertson Jenis, thank you for joining me today. Hey Ryan, nice to be here and thanks for having me. No problem. God bless. All right, you too. Bye-bye.